Hi, this is Steph with Belladonna Dyes, and today we're going to be making a black back rainbow spiral, and this is going to be a liquid dye. It looks like this project is not turned inside out, and there's no rhyme or reason, it just isn't. So first you want to decide where you want the center of your spiral to be and give it a little pinch. And for this one, I'm using a modified fork. Many of you don't have hemostats yet. So all this is, is a inexpensive fork from the dollar store with the two outer tines bent backwards. Then you want to give it a, a couple of twists, two or three twists. And then with the opposite hand, I'm creating the spiral using the microwave splatter guard. And I have a link for the splatter guard in the description box along with everything else that I use for tie-dye so go ahead and check that out. Now the reason why I only give the fork a couple of twists I don't want to tear a hole in the center of the shirt so if I was putting all the pressure on the center by using the fork to make the spiral I'm almost guaranteed to tear a hole in it. So you want to go as far as you can using the splatter guard and then you want to gently wiggle the fork out. Now you want to hold down the center of the spiral because you could pull the whole thing out and then you're gonna have to do it again. And then I'm just going to secure it by using rubber bands. Now this is a larger spiral, so I'm using my stretched out favorite rubber bands. And what that means is when you apply heat to these rubber bands, they don't bounce back to their original shape. So I save them up for larger projects. They work perfectly. What I'm doing now is tightening up my spiral. That's the downside to using the splatter guard. You can only go so far. So the center of the spiral is pretty good, but there's all that outer part of the shirt. It still needs to be pleated up and you know tucked in. So I'm pulling on the loose tails, tucking them into the nearest rubber band. And I'm going to go around and around, working on my pleats and tucking them into the nearest rubber band. And I will do this until I just can't go any farther. Now, a few times here the shirt looks like it wants to taco up so what I do is I go and reinforce the pleats on the opposite side um, to give it more substance and it fixes the problem. If you're having a lot of issues with tacoing your rubber bands are probably too tight you need to go up to a larger size. In total, I'd say I probably spent close to 20 minutes spiraling this shirt and securing it. And I've left a lot of it in because it's summertime and a lot of people are looking for summertime crafts to do with their kids and they wanna learn how to tie dye. So we have a lot of new viewers to the channel and if I edit out a whole bunch, it defeats the purpose because the whole point of this is to try to teach. I have sped this part way up though just to try to save on time. This is a longer tutorial. I've left a lot in because I feel like it's important. Now, some of you are just probably saying to yourself, but why are you spending so much time on this spiral? Well, I have two reasons. The first one being that this is going to be a liquid dye and I cannot rely on the ice barriers to hold in all of the loose tails. So I have to keep going until I get it all tucked in. And the second reason it's going to a fellow tie dyer. So when you're making something for somebody that creates tie dye themselves, you wanna make sure to do a good job, right? Or at least that's how I feel. So I was really meticulous with this shirt. All right, that looks great, but my rubber bands are off center and that's fine. You can leave them like that, but my brain doesn't usually allow for stuff like that. So now I've got to fix them so that they make all of the pieces of the pie. This is going to be an eight color die. So I'm just going to use the rubber bands as my guide. Now I will take a washable marker and mark out where I want my particular colors to be. Since it is an eight color, I want to stay on track. Neither of those steps are necessary. You could have just left it the way it is and start squirting dye on it. But well, you guys know I'm picky. Now it's time for the fun part. We get to add the dye. And I like to start with my primary colors. And my theory behind this 
is when they go down into the center of the spiral and meet, they're going to make the pretty secondary colors instead of making brown. So if I started with the secondary colors and they go down to the center and meet, I think there's a higher chance of creating brown. Don't know if this is true or not, but that's just why I do it. Now I'm not sure if you can tell or not. I can see it because I know what I'm looking for. But if you look right dead center of the spiral, I'm not taking the colors all the way to the very center. I know that the dye is going to creep and you know stretch itself in there. If you add too much, it can just create a muddy dark mess. Now I am reinforcing the colors a little bit because I felt like I didn't get quite close enough to the center of the spiral. And also when you're adding your dye, so it goes on, right? And then a few minutes later, the shirt kind of looks like a fuzzy white look. You know, it's going down, it's penetrating in. When I see that sort of like a white sheen, I add a little bit more dye. And periodically, you're going to see me check the back. I'm looking for my saturation. You know, if I see a whole bunch of dye on the back, I know that I should stop. No more saturation. But if it's not coming through, I know that I can add a little bit more dye. The tip on my green was clogged and it just goes bloop right there and that's disappointing. I wish that wouldn't have happened, but you know, oh well, it's tie-dye. Tie-dye isn't meant to be 100% perfect. So this leg right here is I'm trying to unclog the tip of my bottle. I should also mention that I do have this whole dyeing part of it sped up. Well, the entire tutorial is sped up somewhat, and I have this sped up like three times faster than what I'm actually doing it. Um, you should know that. I'm adding the dye slowly, methodically. I'm not just like going crazy and squirting super fast. You can do that if that's the method that you wanna use, but you know, I, I try to be conscientious and pay attention to what I'm doing. But I also just don't want you to feel like, gosh, you know, it takes me so much longer to make my tie dye than her. Like, why is that happening? So always keep in mind when you're watching one of my tutorials, things are sped up to save on time. Now that I have all of my pieces of the pie on the shirt, I'm just going to go back and add to some of the colors. There are certain colors that I know that need more saturation. For instance, fuchsia red, for me, always leaves me white. And the goal of this shirt is to have no white space at all. I always go back and add more yellow. My yellow always vanishes. And for those of you that have been watching my tutorials for like the last year, you know I never end up with any yellow. So again, certain colors just need a little bit more dye. The blues, they saturate very well and they spread like crazy. For instance, the bluebird and turquoise is a beast when it comes to saturation. Like it can easily take over your entire project. And the deep orange is another one of those colors that 
It saturates well and can dominate anything that you're doing. So these are things to keep in mind when you're making your tie dye. I just checked the back, things are looking pretty good. Not a lot of oversaturation yet. And I noticed that the fuchsia red doesn't look very well saturated. So I'm going to open up the pleats and tuck more dye down in there. And if you noticed when I opened up the pleats, how much white space was still in there. I think I'll just add a little more lemon yellow for good measure. Why not? And then I'm going to use a paper towel to wipe off my rubber bands. I want all of the dye to stay put. I don't want it to travel across the rubber band and you know end up where it's not supposed to be. And then I like to let my project rest for about 10 minutes before I flip it. And then when I come back and flip it, I'm just going to repeat the process. I don't exactly know why I didn't wipe my rack off when I flipped it. I usually do, or I'll just grab a new rack. I don't, I don't know what I was thinking. Maybe because the black back, I didn't need to. I made the shirt so long ago. You guys remember the assembly line black back shirts that I did? I made this at the same time because I was doing liquid that day. Um, so I can't really tell you what I was thinking but like I said normally I wipe off my rack because I'm super conscientious about uh, color cross-contamination so you see what I mean though about how the dye creeps like when I checked the back to walk away for 10 minutes you know the blue saturation was like not like this and then I came back and look at how much it has spread and it spread within its own pie pieces so that's fine but that's why I like to let my projects rest because it's going to creep and do its thing and then I can come back and see how much dye I need to add so that I'm not completely wasting dye by totally oversaturating. But I'll tell you, I typically am heavy handed and oversaturate. And especially on a project like this where I'm trying to avoid white like the plague or like COVID, hee <laughs> hee. Um, <laughs> I lost my train of thought. But anyways, just keep adding your dye. Oh, another thought. You're probably wondering why, if you're just going to do a black back, why are you adding color to the back side? Well, sometimes I just do it like this and I feel like I get a, a brighter shirt. There's like more colors involved instead of it just being hints of color. So I wanted this to be a very bright rainbow with slight black lines. I also know some of you are going to tell me, well, why don't you just paint on the black so you don't have so much? Well, until I get some like sponge brushes, um, this is just how I'm going to do it. Right, the next steps are to prepare your project for batching. So I'll tell you that these little foil pans that you get at the dollar store, they work great for tie dyeing, but they will leak after a couple of times. So you wanna make sure to place your whole setup down inside of a plastic bin or a bucket or a bowl or something to catch the leaks. You see that there? And I like to clean up as I go. I have to bring my projects inside the house um, where it's warm enough to batch. And I don't wanna have dye on the bottom of my container. You know, I don't wanna mess up the house. Now I'm going to do the dip method. So I'm pouring Raven Black into this bowl that I got from the dollar store and they're the perfect size for this type of a project. And I'm just going to set the project in there, dip it for, you know, a few seconds. And then I'm going to place it back up on the rack with the black side facing down. I quickly had to change my gloves. You don't want to leave your project soaking too long. So like I said, put the black side down 
And then it looked like I missed a couple spots, so I'm just using my fingers to kind of go around the edge and just add black so it has a nice uniform look. And then it is recommended that you batch your project at 70 degrees or higher for at least 24 hours. I had to go back and look. I made this shirt April 29th. So April 29th in Oregon, it was, you know, 50 degrees maybe. So I can tell you without a doubt that this shirt batched for at least the full 48 hours and I had it wrapped up in an electric blanket. Everything was getting batched in the electric blanket at that time. You just want to make sure to have maximum vibrancy and you know when your house is cold, you got to do what you got to do. All right, so now it's time for the rinse out and you wanna start by using cold water. That's going to rinse away any soda ash that might still be reacting within the fabric and then increase your water up to hot and rinse until the water runs basically clear. The reason you're getting that soda ash out is you don't wanna have any dark colors redeposit onto your light colors. And then I take it to the washing machine and I wash multiple things together. So if I have a bunch of soda ash, I run the risk of having murky, mucky, you know, shirts. So rinse very well. So once it's at the washing machine, I do two hot water cycles using Kirilon. And that's a professional textile detergent from Dharma Trading Company. And then I do a final hot water cycle using Millsoft, and that's a professional fabric softener. I also get it from Dharma. And the links for them are down below in the description box. It'll make it easy for you to find. And then I'll put it in the dryer and I'll iron it and we'll come back and we'll see the results. Real quick and then we'll get into the normal reveal, but I wanted to share some of the behind the scenes with you. This is the process of me preparing to edit the photographs to share with you. So. The first thing is the cardboard. I found it at Costco. They're just, they want to give away their cardboard. Um, it makes it so much easier to photograph these larger projects on the table. I don't have to take it to the kitchen floor anymore, so I have better lighting. And then second are the little plaques that say front and back that I got from Etsy, Boredom with Jen shop. The wonderful thing about Jen is she's a tie dyer. So she makes smart things that make tie dyeing easier for us. So I highly recommend that you check her out. She's the wonderful person that makes these awesome sinew polars. And today is Father's Day and she's having a sale. So if you wanna get in on that Father's Day sale and get yourself some awesome tie dye items, I suggest you head over there. And then if you're watching this and it's not Father's Day, still go over to her shop boredom with Jen shop and get yourself some cool tie-dye stuff well here it is guys here's our eight color rainbow spiral with a black back liquid dye after it's been washed and dried and ironed and I think it turned out beautiful these are my favorite thing to make I love making rainbows first of all I love making spirals and then I just think the raven black just makes the colors pop now you see on this one, since I filled up both sides with dye, the black isn't as um, overpowering. You'd have to go back and look at some of my previous black back spirals to see what I mean. I think this is just the right amount of black. And then no matter what I do, the fuchsia red always leaves some white. Even though you guys watch me just pack on the fuchsia red, it's just, it doesn't creep. And yay, I have some yellow left. So overall for me, this shirt is a win-win. I think it's beautiful. And would you guys believe it that these are my favorite things to make and I don't actually even own one to wear? I don't, I just end up giving them all away. So <laughs> anyways, what do you guys think of this shirt? Please leave me some comments down below. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to my channel, leave a thumbs up and click the bell and set it to all. That way you get notified of future uploads. And remember, have fun tie-dyeing.